Hello and welcome to the Harry Man Show. This is episode 41. Today I have an old friend, old bandmate, Jamie Reynolds. I met Jamie back in the Phoenix area. Um, we started a band called 1967 and had some rotating members and learned a lot about songwriting and just the, you know, the consistency of practicing. This guy was very devoted. Nice guy overall. He's still doing it. He's still got a lot of band members coming in and out. How you doing, Jamie? I'm doing well, Dustin. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no problem, man. Uh, I know we haven't talked for a while and uh, reached out to you and uh, very, very cool of you to come on the show and kind of share what you're doing these days. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. So I want to talk about the, what you what you do in 1967. You're primarily the singer and uh, songwriter, right? Yeah, I primarily sing and songwrite. And I have played bass in the band live also, as well as drums. Nice. And then I've also recorded drums. Or I've recorded, yeah, I have recorded drums, bass, and guitar and vocals at one point. On various recordings, <laughs> yeah, when, when needed, yeah, yeah, only only if it's like nobody's around to do it. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. So, did you uh, going backwards? Did you did you start on guitar, or did you start on any other instruments, or did it all just come naturally over time? Well, I started on the piano when I was about four years old. Uh, my grandmother Norma, she 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 played piano for about eighty years or so. Oh wow! She started when she was four. And you can imagine she was born in 1917, but she she was my first piano teacher, if you will, and that was uh, a challenging experience. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> she, she brought the hammer down, mm -hmm. and uh, I remember piano being a lot of fun when I first started kind of dinking around on it, and then when she got involved, it was getting kind of serious. <laughs> was she, was she uh, pushing notation on you or theory? Oh yeah, and and metronomes and. Oh wow! Um, just like you need to play like this, and hey, like he was very stern, very slap stern. on the wrist if you don't <laughs> move your hands the wrong way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right on. like the te technique and everything. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good though. I mean, a lot of, a lot of kids are missing that now. The the reality of uh, how hard it is. Mm hmm. So. Oh yeah. So I know you 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 live in Seattle. I'm, I'm sorry, Portland, Oregon. Now is that where you grew up as well? Yeah, I, I, no, I didn't grow up here. I grew up in a, a town called LaConnor, Washington. It's about 60 miles north of Seattle and 60 miles south of the Canadian border. Oh, nice. Little town, little tiny town, mm -hmm. kind of the size of Jerome, Arizona, perhaps. Oh, really? That, that size, maybe a little bit bigger. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Now, uh, you knew, you knew everybody. That's, that's kind of a good, that's kind of a missing factor these days too in most towns, but. Did you grow up playing in bands in your teenage years, or did that something that started in your 20s? Uh, you know, I, I started playing, you know, I did a lot of piano recitals when I, was, when I was a little kid, and then for four or five years, and then so I performed a little bit there, and then um, just around the county that we lived in, and you play at farmhouses out in farmland, big houses and stuff like that, and you go play at a church somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then in eighth grade, is when I started thinking about like forming a band because I was, I was really in Nirvana when they could come out mm -hmm. um, like about the in utero album. And I was learning all that stuff on the guitar and learning Metallica songs, playing guitar. And I was like, yeah, oh, man, let's, let's get a band together. So I, I recruited uh, my friend Alex who played saxophone to kind of emulate those ch cello parts mm -hmm. in the Nirvana unplugged. Mm -hmm. And then, my buddy Eric Larson, he would play bass on the keyboards because he could convert the sound of the keyboard to a bass guitar. Oh, nice. So it's like I had him playing bass parts, and then my buddy Gordy Burke, uh, who I've known since I was just really little, he's a kindergartner, so I was, he, played, he played drums, so I got him on drums, and he's, he's doing backup vocals, harmonies, and stuff like that. Oh, right on. And I was just playing guitar and singing lead. So we had a Nirvana cover band, is what we formed. And we ended up playing at the cultural cultural fair in eighth grade that year, and then we played um, the eighth grade graduation party. Oh, nice, nice! That's a, that's it, was, a good, it, was, it was it was like a big to do, right? Yeah, 
and uh, <laughs> obviously uh, I can definitely hear the grudge style. I mean, the grunge style in your music. Is there? Did that branch off to like bands like Soundgarden or Pearl Jam as well? Oh, yeah, I love all those guys. Yeah, yeah, those are big influences. And coming but, up, coming up in that state, I imagine it was it was more centered around that area as well too. Oh yeah, yeah. Regionally, what was on the radio? The radio station in Seattle, ninety nine point nine KSW, one hundred seven point seven the end. Nice. Those are big alter- alternative rock stations, hard rock. Like you're here in Sabbath, you're in Zeppelin, Boston, all like Alice in Chains, all that Seattle sound. Nice. Screaming Trees, Soundgarden, like you said. Rage Against the Machine, they were, they were coming up a little bit too. Kind of getting snuck in there a little bit occasionally. Nice. Nirvana was huge. Nice. And um, then, uh, MTV, what? I mean, it's, it's all there, you know? Yeah. It's crazy. And then uh, how long did you stay there before relocating to Phoenix? Oh, uh, gosh, I lived there till I was in my late 20s or so. Yeah, I remember that. And then I think I moved, yeah, I moved to Phoenix like I was 27, 28 years old. It was like, we are just needed to move. I needed to get out of there. Check my mouth. We went to the complete opposite. Yeah, yeah. Heat to nothing. Yeah. Um. So as as your yep. styles, did you did you get any, any types of other music as you progressed through your twenties and stuff like that, uh, or, or did you kind of stay on that path for that time being? Well, I ended up forming a band, another band after this. Like my buddy Tim Homiak, who was a year older than I was in school, he approached us that cultural fair and like, "Hey, hey, man, I really want to start a band, mm-hmm. and I don't play music." I'm like, oh, <laughs> well, he was an artist. And he is an artist, like a visual artist and everything. And he drew and he made poem, poems and stuff like that. Um, he was a pretty creative guy. And uh, so we got together and I started teaching to play the bass a little bit. Mm. And he started developing his musical ear over a very long period of time. Um, but uh, yeah, we started writing music together. And then I got I recruited Gordy again from that same uh, Nirvana band. Mm. And then... Um, so we were just a three piece from like, I don't know, 14, 15 years old till we were about 20. Oh, nice. That's and nice. we would play around. Or, yeah, we played Seattle and Everett and uh, up in Bellingham. These are the towns within 50 miles, you know, north and south. And little IOF Hall. We go play near the Navy base over in Oak Harbor and Woody Island over there. And yeah, we developed a little following and had a lot of fun. We played a lot of kind of funk, kind of heavy rock, a little bit of reggae, jam bandy type stuff. Because that's that's what was going on around the valley. There's a lot of bands that were doing jammy type stuff. Yeah, and reggae bands would come into our like local venues. Like the biggest local venue we used to play was called the Rexville Grange. Still there. Oh, nice. Uh, just just out in the middle of a farm field somewhere. It's like just tucked out there. Just a big Grange hall. <laughs> um, but we'd go there and, and just rock out and we'd rent a PA from somebody some guy who rent PAs out to everybody and well, we'd bring our own and we'd just get a bunch of bands on and, and we'd just rock out and have a lot of fun we had, we had bands we looked up to that were in the area local bands that, that, that you wanted to open up for and it was, it was fun we were young we were little kid, we were kids so this was um, obviously pre-social media do you miss the whole networking and kind of yep. flyering the town and all that stuff yeah, you know, and, and that really worked out really well in those days. This is like, you know, 94 to, gosh, 98, 99 or so. Yeah. And, um, yeah, we, I used to do that. We used to flyer everywhere, all the towns that were nearby. And then I, I actually had a mailing list and I actually sent postcards out on many, many shows, which really did help yeah. um, generate people to come out and get their real address. Yeah, the thing is, I yeah. think when you put something on social media now, it's just so much that everything gets looked over super fast. So I kind of miss the the tangible, you know, card, demo CD, flyer. I kind of miss that whole concept as well. Yeah, we did that too. and I couldn't agree anymore. We did a couple different demos, uh, self-produced. Went to a local studio. It was a really fun experience when you're 16 years old. You're excited. And we documented it. It was, it was, it was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. We were pretending we were we were big rock stars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think everyone goes to that. Like, sure. I'm gonna, let, let me get my dad's car so I can drive somewhere. What you know? Yeah, I did think, a truck. I'm gonna borrow his truck to move the gear. Yeah, I, th- <laughs> I think the idea of just going to a recording studio in your teens, or early twenties, was huge. You know, I mean, now everyone has a home studio in their back room in the house, but 
you know, I, I think it was just the concept. You know, you watch that MTV rock documentaries. It was just a huge, like, Goliath of a situation all the time. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and, totally. it, and you had to be ready. You know, I mean, you can't, you can't Pro Tools it and cut it and paste it. You had to be, like, practiced and rehearsed and well-rested. I kind of yeah. miss, I kind of miss that mentality a little bit too. We did that. That's exactly what we did. Now we rehearsed for like a couple of weeks to get ready for it. We're, we're tight. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, my brother Jeff and his band, they were doing all this stuff for, for quite a few years. So we got to watch all that and get all inspired too. Mm-hmm. Um, internally in the family dynamic too. So that was kind of fun. So it kind of got us going and kept us moving. And like he referred us to the studio you know, we, we recorded here, go check it out, you know? Nice. So it was cool kind of, kind of being involved there a little bit as a fan and, uh, influence, if you will. Yeah. And then talking but, about uh, gear, I know, I remember you always had that Rickenbacker bass. Um, was a rush a big influence for you too as well? Yeah, they were. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mom introduced me to that band and so did my brother Jeff. And then, like I heard growing up a little bit, like I heard Tom Sawyer, I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting, you know? Yeah. When I was really young, and then, then later I was reintroduced to it, and then Jeff had all the tapes, my brother Jeff, he had all the tapes, and I borrowed, like, you know, Permanent Waves and a couple other albums, moving pictures, and I think uh, Hemispheres. Mm-hmm. And what was the other one? The Farewell to King? Well, there's a lot. Yeah, I borrowed those four I think, tapes. I think there's those four two. tapes, I was like... <laughs> I was blown away. I was like, whoa. Yeah. Wow. This is, yeah. You know, in high school, I just, just, I wore those tapes out. Yeah. It's insane. So, so um, kind of jumping ahead, uh, leaving high school, was there any bands that you were in before coming to Phoenix? Because I remember you were in a band called Prozac Staple, I believe, right? Yeah. I, feel, I just failed to mention that. Prozac Staple is the band that started with, with Tim and Gordy mm-hmm. when we were like 14. About ninety four, or so okay. Sorry, so the band that. really did start high school as a three piece, and it was that kind of style of music. And then it morphed into something heavier about our senior year. Started to get heavier mm-hmm. and kind of more metal and more proggy, mm-hmm. and a lot of off times. So we were listening to a lot of Tool and Metallica and Rush at that time. Yeah, Soundgarden and all these guys, and like Snot was coming up, uh, System of a Down head PE. So like all of this stuff was starting to get thrown into the pot incubus. Mm-hmm. And, um, so our music started changing a little bit and then, yeah, yeah. So we're like, Hey, we're feeling a little stagnant. And we're like, man, I feel like we need a front man or something like that. Mm-hmm. So we all kind of agreed because, because Gordy, the drummer was our lead singer this whole time. Oh wow. And I would sing backup vocals. Mm-hmm. So he was doing both duties and the music was getting more complicated for him to kind of sing and everything. Yeah. And we have a lot of instrumental interludes <laughs> in a lot of the songs. Yeah. <laughs> like, so then we, we, we knew a guy named Nate Thomas who grew up in Anacord, the town nearby. And he, his bands would play on our shows occasionally. And so we kind of got to know him a little bit through another friend and we'd go hang out at his house in Seattle. He's a little bit older, like 21 at the time. And we'd go party and hang out and spend the night at his house in Seattle. And, he was going to the Art Institute of Seattle, so he was working on his recording engineer degree. Mm-hmm. So he, he he invited us down to record one song. So we did that, had a really good experience. He put a couple vocal lines on it, and we heard what he could do, because he'd growl like a cookie monster. <laughs> and uh, so we just kept talking about, man, we got to recruit that guy. And, and we ended up doing it, and we ended up jamming, and there's chemistry there. And, and then we just started going. On, on that that ride and a few years later early 20s come around get out of the house and move into the band house over in Mount Vernon and we just start writing music all the time because we're sort of all living together mm-hmm. and living nearby and uh and you get a job and you come home and you write music and you hang out with your friends a few times a week and party on the weekends party on the weeknights mm-hmm you walk in your house and it smells like beer. <laughs> yeah. Are we all familiar with that one? Um, <laughs> oh yeah. And then all the roommates and all their friends, you start bringing in the people they know and they, they get to know who your band is. It's all organic. Yeah. And fun and priceless. And like, good memory. And that's what I'm kind of touching back on I, with the technology is a good thing, but I also see how we're kind of losing that in-person networking a little bit because everyone's just doing zoom calls now and virtual practicing that 
I really feel like not not the parting itself per se, but just the you know, whole like community effort is what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. And I, I agree. I, I, that's a, it's kind of a lack there for it, but that's just the evolution of it, I guess. Oh yeah, it makes sense. <clears throat> so not to jump around you on time frame, but you moved to Phoenix <clears throat> and um, you started the, the band 1967. And that's right about the time I met you there. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we put it together, and we we, we kind of had a couple of members going. I remember that one thing I have to compliment you on you is you always wanted to practice. So it was like I think we were practicing just about pretty much every day or every other day at that point. You and I, yeah, yeah. You know, I started I started this thing with you. It was about 2011 or so. Yeah, and I know I wrote a lot of the demos with Gordy, the guy in Project Staple. Uh huh. In like oh, 2009 or so, like we were kind of dinking around on the phone because he still in Washington at the time. Mm-hmm. And like a couple of the, the songs and riffs, like um, Dead End Life and When Love Ruled the World and like Working for No Reason, like those kind of songs, like we had guitar demos for them. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was involved in a lot of the kind of helping me get that together a little bit. So we were doing a lot of melody writing. And then, so I had all that stuff. And then I ended up cutting a demo of Dead End Life all on my own with a local studio. I can't remember what the studio was called, but Jim, what was his name? Jim from the Funk Junkies. He's the bass player of the Funk Junkies. Okay. Ran that studio. Mm-hmm. Him and Joe Valiente, the lead singer of the Funk Junkies. I don't know if you've heard of that band. Yeah, I have. is this in Phoenix? Um, yeah. Is it Tall Cats? Yeah, Highland High. Highland Studios. Highland okay. Studios. All right, gotcha. Yeah. So Joe referred me to him. So I went in. Um, I had done all the guitars and the, and the bass and the vocals with a click at home. And then I brought it all in the gym and we just knocked drums out in like a day or whatever, like mm-hmm. a few hours. Kind of a quick little. And then that's kind of, and I went home and mixed it my own, on my own. And then I used that as a demo to try to find people and and then I think I presented that recording to you yeah. over at Guitar Center. Yeah, I remember the parking lot. And you're like, you want to listen to something? I'm like, I guess. <laughs> and I followed you out there. And then I, yeah. I was like, yeah, this is actually really good, man. Let's uh, do something. And then it, it kind of spiraled pretty fast from there. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I was recruiting. I think I hit you up one time. Like, yeah, and then it came back to it again. Yeah. When I had it all done. But uh, I was just trying to figure out a how do I meet musicians? I thought that would be a good place to start. Yeah, always, yeah. I mean, I don't know if these days, but yeah, is that, is you would think that would be a hub for, you know, the musicians trying to play. I guess shows would be another another way to find people, but... Uh, yeah, I was playing with a Nirvana tribute at the time, in and out with a couple different guys, too. And then I had met... Um, probably met Robert Jorgensen as well. Yep. And then... Uh, but yeah, you and I, we just started, I think... In, what, you invited me out to your house or something like that? Yeah. I just remember having and a we massive just playing. Uh, DW kit set up. <laughs> it was like overkill, big kit set up and all that stuff. Yeah, there was like five, three, four drum sets. Like your dad had one set up, your your brother, Taylor. I mean, everybody was like drumming out out there. And yeah. It was pretty fun. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, oh, just, mu- musical house. Yeah, I remember I'd gone through a Neil Pert phase around that time, too, and I just wanted, like, the three bass drums, the ten toms, and, you know, we all go through those phases. Mm-hmm. But, uh... Yeah, <laughs> so, what, I want to ask, as you kind of move to the country, what are your memorable uh, venues that you play with the band in any state or any city? What were the ones that stood out to you the most? Well, I, I think in Phoenix we came up with a pretty solid lineup. Like after I had played with you and, and Robert and Jordan, um, I think, uh, so me and Jordan kind of, kind of moved on when played with, um, a guy named Nathan Marchie. Mm-hmm. He's a drummer mm-hmm. and he had just moved to Phoenix. Dave Ellison from Megadeth had referred me to him. Nice. I was like, yeah, check him out. And then, um, uh, Robert, well, you know, I have with Robert, we kind of, um, his schedule was getting kind of busy, so then I, we found Luke and Luke Luke Sarkowski. Yeah, that's how you pronounce it. Yeah, I think so. Um, <laughs> so he it was me, me, Luke, Jordan, and Nathan. We jammed quite a bit. Mm-hmm. 
over at Band Oasis, kind of got the set together and then played, I think, one show and then Luke's gear, like, completely just cracked out at that show. Really? <laughs> I didn't yeah. know that. That's a bummer. So, yeah, he, he was, it, it was a pretty tight little lineup there. And then I think after that, he's like, okay, I'm, I'm not really feeling the live vibe. It's mm-hmm. not my deal. Yeah. I don't even know if he's ever really played any live shows after that, to be honest. You know, I haven't reached out to him, but I've always been curious what he's doing. But I'll look I'll look into it. I think we're still friends on Facebook there. I love that guy. Yeah, he was a really good guy. <laughs> really uh, mellow, laid um, back. You know, just kind of, he was a quick learner. He always caught on, had a good attitude. Those are the type of, you know, band members oh, you yeah. want. You know what I mean? <laughs> Very cooperative. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, love that. Um, so. Skilled player, too. Yeah, I, t- I remember. Yeah, and then, so yeah, and then. Then we got Scotty. Scotty came out later, and then they were kind of we were buttoned up with our lineup at that point. We got it finally, I think, a little bit, mm-hmm. and uh, that we started playing out quite a bit. We were doing a lot of original stuff, just kind of hitting the clubs in Phoenix, and then it kind of morphed into cover band plus originals, like two, three hours set kind of thing. All right, on. And we just played all over Arizona, and um, and then we started kind of branching out into California a little bit. And then, yeah, that's kind of when the whole uh, lineup members started coming into play. Like, then this guy named Matt Hassel on, came in on drums on a, as a backup. And because I was trying to book shows full time, mm-hmm. that's all I was doing was playing music. Nice. So that's a dream. <laughs> <laughs> so challenging you, work. So the way you were doing it, were you setting up members in different cities, and as you traveled, you were using them? Is that how you were doing it, or were you were trying to keep one lineup and travel with them? For a little while, I was trying to do one lineup and travel, and then I found out that you know we all have jobs and and families and things like that, so it gets it gets a little hairy, yeah, schedule wise and logistic wise. So I was like, man, I need to start getting some more people, mm-hmm. kind of like recruiting a corporation. Yeah, a little bit. I think the more people I recruit, the more likely it is I'm going to play more shows that year. Yeah, and you just have to go through a quick rehearsal so. before the show, and then you're always like kind of ready to go. Yeah, and you get people to set list, and you give them a song list, a bunch of covers, and then all the originals, and they just learn it. And then you go rehearse a little bit, kind of button it up. Now, and then they're ready to roll. Now, currently, are you still with the lineup in 1967, or are you taking a hiatus due to current events? Um, yeah, it's been hiatus for sure. The last show that we played was with a couple guys here in Portland that I had recruited. Um, Sean Kenny and Will Strong. Nice. And then... Uh, we played in February of 2020, I think, is the last show I played yeah, I here think, in Portland. I think that's kind of the same time frame everyone else was out, too. Oh, yeah. So, yep. is there any plans to kind of go back out? And I mean, obviously, no one has a time stamp on anything like that, but is there plans in later this year, or are you kind of just kind of waiting it out? Well, we're kind of waiting it out. We heard that this year it was going to open up a little bit, so mm-hmm. we were going to rebook that. I had a five-song or a five-day tour booked from Eugene, Oregon, all the way up to up towards Canada. Yeah. It's five in a row. Nice. Yeah, and so that was all booked up, and then all this started happening. So I'd probably, I'd probably rebook that mm-hmm. if I can. That's where I'd start. You just kind of go where we left off. Nice. And I know so, I, just, I recently just went and saw some live music with a, a friend of mine, and it's a hassle, man. It's, it's really hard to get people excited when they can't do this and they can't do that. So it's almost like is it worth it just to wait it out or kind of just kind of struggle through it, you know? Mm-hmm. And it, you know, when you have lim- exactly. limitations, you can't walk here, you can't do that. It kind of kills the vibe in my opinion. Yeah. I can't, couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. And it's, exactly. I so saw from a, I don't know, from a freedom standpoint, I just see it as like, I think, you know, should just wait and then kind of go full out, you know, with no restrictions in my opinion. Yeah, exactly. So exactly. Uh, past tense i mean what would be the best place to reach out and uh, listen to the band's music uh, is there any sites or websites that you recommend you can go on all the online retailers and find us like itunes and, and all that jazz and if you go to www.1967band.com nice. 1967band.com mm-hmm. that has the links to all the online retailers and sort of brings in our facebook posts into the site that's yeah that'd be a good place to start nice <clears throat> and yeah I'll, I'll definitely post the links on there to help you guys out 
Um, Jamie, I know you got a full day ahead of you. I just want to thank you for coming on and kind of telling us what you're up to. I'd like to have an episode with the whole band comes on when things are kind of a little bit up and going. But uh, thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you as well, Dustin. I'm grateful. Yeah, no problem. Good man. to reconnect with you, my friend. Yeah, and then, <laughs> when you come through Phoenix, Same. I mean, I can probably fill in or help you out. You know how it goes. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, kind of touch base. Um, like, some of those songs would probably come back to me naturally without me realizing it. <laughs> I know. Yeah. There's a lot of people that have played those songs. Yeah. That's about almost 20, 20 of people. Yeah. I'm sure they changed and I'm sure they evolved and you changed, but that's all the good of it, though, you know? Yeah, a lot of growth, a lot of maturity for sure in life. Gotcha. It's been 10 years. Yeah. You know, it's a decade, right? Yeah, it's a long, well, it's not it's really the beginning it is. of this thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, it's pretty amazing stuff. Feel free to reach out to Jamie. Um, check out his music. He's a really cool guy. He's got some good stuff to listen to. Um, once again, check us out on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube. You guys all have a good day, and thank you, Jamie. You're, well, you're welcome, Dustin. Have a great day.